Question from a disciple. Is Buddha Chitta based on renunciation? Answer. Early Shravaka practitioners can be categorized into two types. The first type seeks to enter Nirvana, and the second type progresses from Hinayana to Mahayana. The first type of Shravaka practitioners don't generate Buddhacitta or aspire to attain Buddhahood. They only seek to attain Ahatsha. They strongly aspire to transcend the three realms, so they don't pursue anything else. That's why 5,000 Shravaka practitioners left before the Buddha expounded the Lotus Sutra. They are practitioners with a fixed Shravaka nature. Practitioners with a fixed Shravaka nature are reluctant to learn the Mahayana teachings or save sentient beings. They only seek their own liberation. Another type of Shravaka practitioners study the Mahayana teachings. Eventually, they transition from Hinayana to Mahayana and transform their renunciation into Bodhicitta. During the Republic of China era, Master Tai Su highly praised the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, translated by Master Fazan as this path is safe. The three principal aspects of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, and the insight of emptiness expounded by Lama Tsongkhapa address many common issues encountered in spiritual practice. The foundation, renunciation can not only motivate us to transcend the samsaric mind, but also help us cultivate genuine bodhicitta. It is crucial. Many Mahayana sutras and treatises don't emphasize the stages of spiritual practice, but rather start directly with generating Buddha However, liberation from the suffering of samsara is always an essential prerequisite for Buddhist practice. Therefore, their principles also align with the essence of the Mahayana teachings. If renunciation only refers to renouncing samsara and attachment to the three realms, then this essence is already encompassed in Buddhacitta. Buddhacitta is free from attachment to notions, permanence and attainment. Hence, with Buddhacitta, one naturally won't cling to the five desires and six sense objects. Therefore, Buddhacitta already encompasses part of the essence of renunciation. People with sharp faculties can directly cultivate Buddhacitta. That's why Mahayana teachings often expound Buddhacitta but don't emphasize renunciation. However, It is not easy for ordinary people to directly generate bodhicitta, let alone generate it properly. Without a clear understanding, it is easy to confuse bodhicitta with the samsaric mind. One may not be aware of one's intention and may even regard the virtuous intentions of the human and heavenly vehicle as bodhicitta. Based on renunciation, we can better ensure the purity of Buddhacitta. I also often emphasize that it's easy to confuse the virtuous intentions of the human and heavenly vehicle with Buddhacitta. Without renunciation as a foundation, or in other words, if one has never generated renunciation in past lives, it is impossible to directly start with generating bodhicitta in this life. People with sharp faculties have already practiced the Theravada teachings in countless past kalpas. 
they have cultivated renunciation for numerous lifetimes. Hence, they naturally possess renunciation without practicing it in this life. They don't need to intentionally generate the aspiration to transcend the three realms because they inherently possess it. Once they come across the teachings on renunciation, they understand it. Hence, we cannot compare with others because the faculties of individuals vary. Some people can cultivate a qualified renunciation in just three days. Yet, you may spend three or even ten years cultivating renunciation, but still cannot achieve what they attain in three days. For those with sharp faculties, once they take a look at the teachings on renunciation one or two times, they understand it. Once they understand it, they can immediately put it into practice. People who have cultivated renunciation in past lives are like this. People with sharp faculties are also like this. For those who have realized the true nature of reality in their past lives, upon encountering their teachings in this life, they will awaken and soon attain enlightenment. We cannot compare with others because the faculties of individuals vary. Don't think, wow, how do they progress so quickly? Why do they not even need to cultivate renunciation? In reality, they cultivated renunciation and even bodhicitta in their past lives. Hence, they inherently possess the sharpest faculties in this life. For example, did the sixth patriarch need to cultivate bodhicitta? He directly realized the true nature of reality. While cutting firewood in his twenties, he heard someone reading a sutra. Then he immediately renounced worldly life and soon attained enlightenment. In his past lives, he had already attained ultimate bodhicitta, not to mention conventional bodhicitta. Don't compare with others because the faculties of individuals vary. This is how it is. So, don't envy others. Some people can swiftly attain enlightenment after a brief study. However, if one has never cultivated renunciation in their past lives, their samsaric mind and attachment to the eight worldly concerns are strong. After accumulating some merits, they might be captivated by wealth and prosperity. Even if they become monastics, they might be the same. After becoming wealthy, they might go astray and cling to money. They might return to the secular world, build a three-story house and get married. Such people haven't cultivated renunciation well. Those who have cultivated a qualified renunciation will never engage in such activities. So we cannot compare with others because the faculties of individuals vary. Becoming a monastic doesn't necessarily mean having sharp faculties. A lay practitioner's renunciation might be better than a monastic's renunciation. It depends. Some people guide sentient beings in the secular world. Although they haven't become monastics, it doesn't mean that their renunciation is poor. In special circumstances, they may have to practice the Buddhasattva path, so they have no other choice. Sometimes this is the situation. When their bodhicitta is well cultivated, in special circumstances, they may also choose to benefit sentient beings as lay people. They cannot be monastics in every lifetime. Occasionally, they may also be lay people. However, generally, 
they would choose to become monastics. We should be aware that while we can progress from renunciation to bodhicitta, generating renunciation and realizing emptiness don't necessarily guarantee the attainment of great compassion and bodhicitta. Otherwise, there would be no difference between Shravaka vehicle and Bodhisattva vehicle. Some people who study Chan school or Pure Land school, despite learning Mahayana teachings and reading Mahayana scriptures, only generate renunciation. They only seek their own liberation but forget Bodhicitta. Only through corresponding visualizations and practices can we awaken the compassion in our Buddha nature. Therefore, Bodhicitta doesn't arise spontaneously, but requires special conditions. For example, some people understand the Mahayana teachings to some extent, such as the emptiness of phenomena and the dependent arising. However, they haven't awakened their conventional bodhicitta. Although they have the seed, they haven't awakened it. As a result, they don't have much compassion for sentient beings. Therefore, we need to awaken bodhicitta. It's hard for such people to realize the ultimate bodhicitta. They can only understand and realize the Mahayana teachings of the dependent arising and the nature of emptiness to some extent. However, they cannot truly realize the great perfection or see the true nature of reality. Why? Because seeing the true nature of reality is synonymous with realizing the ultimate bodhicitta. If you haven't even cultivated the conventional bodhicitta, you won't attain the ultimate bodhicitta. There is a causal relationship between them. In other words, if you haven't generated the conventional bodhicitta, you won't generate the ultimate bodhicitta. Although you may understand it a little, what you attain is not bodhicitta. That's why the author says that bodhicitta doesn't arise spontaneously, but requires special conditions. Similarly, practicing concentration doesn't necessarily give rise to wisdom. Many people may think that after entering deep concentration, wisdom without defilement will immediately arise, like an eruption. However, This is not true. Please bear in mind that wisdom without defilement doesn't immediately arise after entering deep concentration. That is not the case. Only through listening, contemplation and meditation can we gradually attain wisdom. Concentration is only a skillful means and condition for cultivating wisdom. In other words, with concentration, one can cultivate wisdom more swiftly. Otherwise, why would non-Buddhist practitioners consider the four meditations and eight concentrations as the ultimate goal and nirvana? Some non-Buddhist practitioners can enter deep concentration, such as the four meditations and eight concentrations. They can abide in deep concentration for thousands of kalpas. They have a strong power of concentration, but lack wisdom. Concentration is just a condition for cultivating wisdom. Only by developing wisdom through listening and contemplation, such as contemplating impermanence, non-self and dependent arising, can we attain genuine wisdom. To cultivate wisdom, we should listen to the Buddha's teachings. Only after learning the Buddha's wisdom, 
the right view for a long time, can we develop a firmer understanding. Then, through continuous practice, we can eventually attain enlightenment. Therefore, please bear in mind that wisdom doesn't arise right after practicing concentration. While non-Buddhist practitioners can enter deep concentration, their wisdom doesn't emerge directly. They lack wisdom. Wisdom doesn't arise solely through practicing concentration or chanting mantras. It's essential to learn and contemplate the Buddha's teachings. We can first contemplate impermanence and then contemplate non-self and dependent arising. If you don't cultivate the right understanding and view, you won't ignite wisdom free from defilements. Some people who practice the mind and mind teaching have this misconception. They think the guru said that after engaging in 1,000 sessions of the mind and mind practice with six mudras and one mantra, one will attain enlightenment. This is a big misconception. Guru Yuan Yin said, Only those with sharp faculties can engage in this practice. What does sharp faculties mean? The sixth patriarch said that the Chan school aims to guide those with the sharpest faculties and only they can practice it. Our mind in mind practice aims to guide those with sharp faculties. People with average or dull faculties cannot practice it at all. Why? Because they lack wisdom. If one doesn't thoroughly understand the teachings and lacks the foundations such as the wisdom of non-self, renunciation and bodhicitta, one's faculties are average or dull. Those with sharp faculties have a good renunciation, bodhicitta, and wisdom of emptiness. They are just a step away from enlightenment. At this point, once they practice this teaching, they will attain enlightenment. This is how it works. According to the Tantric tradition, The empowerment of the mind and mind practice is the fourth level empowerment. Have you heard of it? Guru Yuanyin told us that the empowerment of the mind and mind practice is the fourth level empowerment. In the Vrajrayana tradition, the fourth level empowerment is the highest. Hence, it can only be practiced by those with sharp faculties. However, when you visit Guru Yuanyin, he might compassionately build a karmic connection with you, reassuring you that by engaging in 100 sessions of the mind and mind practice, you won't go to hell. In reality, if you sincerely recite the Buddha's name, you will also be exempt from going to hell. It is a skillful means. In this regard, those who engage in the mind and mind practice have many misconceptions. They don't understand the teachings, but blindly engage in the practice. Consequently, they often encounter problems. Without the foundation of renunciation, it is impossible to generate bodhicitta directly. Why? because bodhicitta is the aspiration to liberate sentient beings from samsara and attain buddhahood. If you don't even seek liberation from samsara, how can you aspire to liberate others? Bodhicitta is the aspiration to transcend both discontinuous death and transformative death and ultimately attain buddhahood. To attain buddhahood, We must transcend discontinuous death 
because renunciation is the aspiration to transcend discontinuous death. That's why we say Buddha Chitta must encompass renunciation. Buddha Chitta is the aspiration to liberate all sentient beings from the cycle of birth and death. Please note that it is the ultimate liberation, not just liberation from discontinuous death. Renunciation is only a preliminary skillful means and a stage before achieving ultimate liberation. Hence, Bodhicitta must encompass renunciation. If you haven't even attained liberation from discontinuous death, how can you attain Buddhahood? Since you want to transcend discontinuous death, you must have renunciation. So, the principle is quite simple. 